Um, welcome all of you. Um, I'll introduce myself in a second, but before I'll just introduce the theme that we will be discussing in this short session. So we're looking at leadership in this conversation and specifically around leading artistic practice rather than participating in other people's. So my name is Kate. I am a white middle-aged woman. Today I'm wearing black jeans, brown boots. I have a stripy jumper. Um, I have um, black glasses on and my hair is long with a fringe. Um, my left arm is shorter than my right arm and I have one hand. It would be really great if we could just go and um, around and introduce ourselves. So I'll start on my left. Hello everyone. I'm, da I'm Dalibor. I'm, I'm tall, uh, white male. Uh, on myself, I have a black hoodie. Uh, and underneath, I have a, a T-shirt with uh, hard to describe uh, um, cool motifs. Uh, but these motifs uh, are like some from some, some science fiction horror, horror movie. And also, I wear jeans and uh, shoes. Hi, my name is Chisato, and my sign name is Chisato, tapping the tip of my nose twice. I'm an East Asian woman. I have short brown hair. I've got purple flowery dress on, and I'm middle-aged, and I'm deaf. Hi, my name is Maria Oshodi, um, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a middle-aged, mm, sort of brown, uh, mixed heritage, blind uh, artist and today I'm wearing a black jumper underneath a kind of terracotta corduroy pair of dungarees with brown boots on. My name is Mark Brew, I use he him pronouns, I'm six foot two, I'm a wheelchair user, uh, I have a shaved head, I'm wearing a cap, I'm wearing all black top and jeans, brown boots and some beads around my wrist and I'm an artistic director, choreographer, and dancer. Thank you. Um, actually, um, Mark, that's a really great reminder. I'm gonna reverse the semicircle, and I, if we could just give a sentence about uh, however you want to identify what you do, your practice. So Mark, are you happy? Is that, does that feel good for you? Do you yep. want to add? That's great, I'm happy to wear that. Brilliant, if we can go back round, starting with you, Maria, that would be great. Um, so I'm uh, an artistic director and CEO of a disabled-led um, theatre company. I'm also an independent artist and a kind of access consultant as well at times. Thank you. I am a deaf artist and director. I'm a performing artist. I'm also a um, BSL art tour guide as well. I'm. Uh, I'm also a disabled uh, artist. I uh, co-produced, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is uh, one of our, our performance for, from, from Perrard's uh, Perrard Inclusion, which is an artistic in, in, inclusion uh, uh, inst institution. Um, uh, and I, and uh, one of our performance is based on my idea. And the other, and the other performance uh, is uh, is uh, almost all based uh, on on my thoughts, uh, my ideas, and other things. Great, thank you all. And um, I am a self-identifying Crip artist, researcher, um, and mainly these days I. Um, work in uh, not only in research but in producing the work of other crip and disabled artists so i'd like to kick us off with a provocation and that is um, do we feel that it is important that deaf and disabled artists initiate and lead on projects rather than participating in projects that um, have been devised by non-disabled directors or um, leaders. This is Mark speaking. Um, I do feel like it's important. Um, I knew from my own personal experience, uh, 25 years ago when I acquired my disability, there was no disabled leadership. There were no, what I'd like to say, more role models, people to aspire to, or people that I could 
um, relate to, to go, oh, I could do that, or, or I could continue my career as a dancer or as a choreographer. Initially, I was told, no, I couldn't because I was disabled. So I think having that representation and having that disabled and deaf leadership is really important, also because they then come with that lived experience and knowledge and empathy to know that uh, to ask the questions, create space so everyone is heard and everyone's needs are met. Yeah, I agree. I mean, why not have a deaf or disabled leader, you know? Because um, deaf and disabled people, obviously they can show their performance art as well. And their work is there, so why not show that more? And I feel like it needs to become more sort of widespread and um, yeah, it's like kind of a new emerging thing almost, but it needs to be shown more, yeah. Mm. Thank you, all of you. I mean, what, one, one thing that I'm getting from what you're all saying, and there's little differences um, in, in all your comments, is the, the, the difference between representation of deaf and disabled artists on stage or in performance and um, the work that has been initiated, started by and led by deaf and disabled artists. It feels like, um, I mean, I'm aging myself here, but certainly when I started, when I began working as a dancer, it, it seemed that deaf and disabled artists were somewhat restricted to um, performing in the work of other people. Um, and I'm hearing from, from all of you now that, that, there's, that it's important that we address that difference, the, the value of having our artistic inquiry and our artistic voices as leaders is that am i understanding that yeah completely i mean that's why like 20 25 years ago i set up the um, extant which was a company that around um visual impairment and um kind of um trying to elbow some room to um, have this space f for uh, visually impaired people who felt like they were kind of not really, um, which we didn't have that space to just inquire and investigate and do that kind of exploratory work um, um, on what it meant, you know, to, to have our, our bodies and our perception in um, on a stage space and also as audiences as well, you know, and finding creative ways to integrate access and all that, that I felt like no one was going to do it, so we had to do it ourselves. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, I can't remember what you said, but whatever, yeah. <laughs> um, Kate, I also did want to mention that I think there definitely are benefits to also disabled artists and deaf artists you know, working with their peers of non-disabled artists and also potentially being led by non-disabled artists. But I just don't think our voice can be forgotten and not be a part of that, as we said, which is, I think is a key word, collaborative process. And I know when I first came to the UK and started working, it was being, you know, led so many times by, by non-disabled choreographers. And, and, and then when taught, I remember I wasn't able to teach on my own as a disabled artist. I had to teach with a non-disabled person, where now I teach all of my workshops on my own, on my own um, and that's been a 20-year progress to happen, to sort of, to prove that I could do that on my own, you know, just because of disability doesn't mean I cannot do that or it's not valid, which it is, of course. So I think there's also benefits to, to both in working collaboratively with non-disabled artists or if leaders, if people are leading projects that are non-disabled, then I would encourage them to, if they're working in this integrated or inclusive setting, to bring the voices of disabled artists into those decision makings and into the project so it's not forgotten about and then it becomes a, dis a non-disabled led project without that collaboration. Yeah. It is also a, a good way uh, uh, for, for people to know us better. Yeah, absolutely agree. So this notion of elbowing in um, is something I, I equate with leadership is the notion of failure. So, Maria, when you talk about um, uh, artistic inquiry and exploring, I think that space feels equally important in terms of deaf and disabled artists leading, that we have space to go wrong and to fail and to try again and emerge into leadership rather than have leadership put on us, <laughs> which actually I think can feel like a real pressure to, to say, there's no disabled leaders, quick, be one. And I think actually I've, I've 
many times experienced that not quite working because the 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 steps aren't in place to kind of emerge into leadership in a gentle way. Does that resonate with anybody? Yeah, definitely. I think that's right. Um, I've been in a situation where there's a non-disabled person leading and also where there has been a disabled person leading. And I found it difficult to show sort of my deaf elements of my art. Um, so, I mean, as a deaf artist, communication is key and it can really be an issue obviously um, of course like I have interpreter access right now that's what you would need in, in place but if you are trying to communicate with deaf people or hearing people the rhythms can be very different so sometimes you'll find one or the other is slightly left behind and so deaf leadership it, it kind of works well for me in that it's the rhythm of it is a deaf rhythm and so with the team of people I'm working with, which are mostly hearing people actually, and some have invisible disabilities or, or, or a few people I work with are also deaf. What I try and do is bring everyone into my sort of deaf rhythm of communication. And the pace moves at such a way that it's sort of, everyone's kept up with it. And um, it's sort of a melding of two, two worlds and communication is um, a really important thing. And that is um, a, a really useful and helpful space in, in a place where I can show my deaf elements and I can create that art because I've set up that space. And, you know, it, it's like if you had a, um, a blind led um, piece of work and you had a room which is set up to, to be, um, you know, conducive to that way of working. Um, I think that's, that's a good, good thing for me to do, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I think that, that that links for me in, in what, what needs to be... Right, I think we focus a lot on what the obstacles to deaf and disabled leadership are. And actually, I really like the way you've just explained that. Rather than looking at obstacles, it's for me very interesting to explore what, we, what, what the optimum <laughs> circumstances are. Rather than looking at what's lacking, actually saying if the space is set up like this in terms of practical access, communication, the, the access in its broadest sense, then um, authentic leadership feels much um, more possible. So thank you for that. That's a really great point. So moving on, if that's OK, um, this is kind of um, uh, just for all of us. I'd like to offer the, the provocation of how are you a leader in your practice or in your life, how, what, however that question lands for you and we don't have to go in a, in a line just you can I can start this is Mark speaking yeah, <laughs> um, that thing about putting a title on you I think for me maybe I'm seen as a leader in in the work that I do I, I feel like I lead through collaboration that is definitely key to my practice as an artist when I'm working in workshops or whether I'm choreographing a work, whether I've been commissioned or whether I'm leading on a project as the, the key leader. But I always feel like it's all of us in the room. And for me, my role is to create a space that everyone feels that they're a part of, that feel that it's safe, but also a brave space to try things. And that we're working collaboratively because I want to hear other people's voices as well. I mean, obviously there are times that I need to make decisions, um, but I sort of feel like I hopefully am really trying to lead through through participation and through collaboration and not so much just using the title, I'm a leader. Hi. Yeah, deaf leadership. Um, I mean, it means definitely obviously aware, awareness of communication within the space and also um, really it's a sensory disability. So it's not a physical disability, it's sensory. And so that's a, a big part of it, uh, the leadership style for me. And everyone's different um, senses are, are different, obviously. And um, deaf leader sort of becomes like a, a curator almost of everything in the room and the senses that are there and what you can make from that. So it's quite unique. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. 
It's really interesting, um, the idea of cur curation. Um, I, I, I like that word. I never think about mm -hmm. us in terms of that because, you know, um, I just always think about exhibitions and museums, things like that. But it's a lovely word, isn't it? Because it, it feels like that is, it feels like a kind of a really whole um, engagement with um, the, the, the space that you're occupying, everything. And I think that when you're thinking about that in terms of, particularly when you're integrating access into your work as well, um, it, it becomes that, you know. Um, but to get to that point, as um, a human who is perceived by society as not, 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 much, not much as expected, you know, um, I think that's, that's where the how, how comes into it. Because I think that just um, working with the mindset that you're, that not, that not much is expected of you and that you need to get to the point where you, um, you are taken seriously is, is a big thing around leadership, just to get to that point, mm. to, get, to get into the, the, the room and, and sit with people to collaborate with in a serious way. Um, and that sometimes is just the minutiae of managing your own life, you know, um, and then everything else, you know, that it takes to be an artist. Um, and, you know, it, I, I just think that that thing, thing shouldn't be underestimated because it's like massive. And, and that feels for me, thank you for raising that, because in terms of a discussion, all of us here who I would say uh, for my own objective position are in different ways and at different times being leaderful. Um, but Maria, your point feels really important, especially that, that this conversation is going to be publicly available. I don't, uh, um, and I'm sorry because I haven't prepared for this provocation, but you've just made me think about it. I think often my experience of feeling like a leader um, can, that I have this duality or, and you've just made me think about it, that in my everyday, if you like, pedestrian life, sometimes even travelling to a moment where I'm going to perform my leadership, whether that's speaking at a conference or doing something like this, when I'm in the world, <laughs> outside of this place I've created for myself, I'm, I'm aware I'm often very much perceived as someone who, of whom not much is expected. And I think that's, a, that's, that's useful information to put out into the wider world, that there's a navigation there that I may get in a taxi and it would be unthinkable that I would be coming to lead or be autonomous um, when I'm encountering that kind of what happened to you thing. And then, then so I'm, I'm often dipping in and out of leadership. Does that, does that resonate with any of you? I don't, I don't have a distinction. They are different ways of doing the same thing. And I find it sometimes more challenging being in um, the practice space um, because um, uh, some of the kind of artistic um, aspirations uh, are dependent on the c a, a collaborative model and the input of uh, other people's contribution and um, but like Mark said you know there are certain points where you have to, decisions have to be so I'm really interested to hear what Delaval has to say about the way the family model works because yeah. mm -hmm. I don't I don't understand but it'd be really good to hear because I'm at some point someone has to make a decision somewhere you know and um, and 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 those times you know for me uh, has a sensory impairment like Chisato, uh, some of those decisions are around visual things and I have a very strong internal visual barometer and um, but that's reliant on the way that those things are interpreted to me and sometimes I will go with my instinct which goes completely against what everyone else is seeing in the room or telling me and I will be have to be really quite bloody minded about it and more, I've been in this game for quite a while and I'd say most of the time the decision I make is right and what that's based on I don't know apart from the just it's a kind of like a gut thing um, but you know that's the bit where I found the whole leadership thing is really weird because 
I'm having to um, um, make, you know, I occupy that space as, you know, this is a space that I've created and I'm going to take, you know, you know, um, but I'm basing decisions based on things that, a sense that I don't have, you know, yeah. also, so, so, you know, seemingly, or oh, yeah, well, I don't have it, but, you know, and that's the bit where it gets a bit weird and, yeah, that's all I can say. It gets a bit weird and I just have to go with it and I've become quite bullish about it and, you know, and it, it's like... I think in a moment, Alibor, I'm going to ask you to talk about this family model, but I just, I just want to add, Maria, you, I think there's a really important distinction there. And if you bear with me while I'm slightly anecdotal, at the, the beginnings of so-called inclusive contemporary dance, there was a big argument that improvisation was probably the only way that deaf and disabled people could fully, that it was the best way because it was uh, less codified and all those reasons. And so I think you've made a very important distinction there that I wouldn't want to send us down a path where deaf and disabled artists have to lead collectively or collaboratively. I, I actually want to make space where we can have collective and collaborative leadership, but we can also have bloody minded, bullish leadership from deaf and disabled artists who actually want to want to be, no, I am the decision maker that in an ideal world. So thank you for that distinction. I hadn't kind of made sense of that myself, but I think it's a really important one. I would, no. uh, I would also li like to add something. Uh, I would try to be, to be re uh, really fast now. Um, uh, um, for, for me, it's, uh, it is hard to, to practice leadership and, and to be a leader, for example, uh, be because, uh, uh, because uh, in this, uh, now a little bit spoiler alert again, <laughs> In in the in my performance called something very special. Um, um, uh, um, uh, there there are many parts of uh, of this uh, performance that I uh, that I read or talk, and and in, and in some parts I, I have to sound like a, like a teacher. In some, in some parts like uh, like some 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 yoga instructor, or, or in some parts I, I need to sound sound. Uh, a, a, a bit angry, so I need to pra to practice uh, uh, lots of different model models of uh, of leadership for this mm -hmm. for this performance. So thank you for that, and I wonder just if you can briefly just um, as as Maria suggests, how how do you experience this family model of leadership? How does it how does it operate for you as a member of the company? Well, uh, I feel uh, uh, fa uh, I experience family model as a as, as a le leadership is, as a leadership uh, in a way as I said before, like uh, like that that we function like collective consciousness, but uh, we are, we are also uh, uh, in our communication is re is really great. We are also talking uh, about uh, our uh, other pro other problems that, that are that are not that are not connected just uh, just in our in our artistic wor work. Uh, we, uh, we are we are sometimes trying trying to solve uh, when some someone has uh, has some some personal no, no psych psychological problem. Uh, 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 also also for uh, for example we have uh, we have uh, our. Uh, our our Viber, Viber group where, where we sometimes uh, uh, write some uh, some things that, that that happened to to us uh, or or put some, put some put some photos. Uh, I'm uh, I will just add briefly that we that we um, that we make uh, make the, this uh, this Viber group when uh, when the, pandem the pandemic started to to be to be in contact uh, and not to feel not to feel alone. Okay. I'm reminded, Dalibor, in what you're saying uh, about some of Chisato's comments around um, the importance of shared language or finding shared language. Does that resonate with you, Chisato, in this kind of collaborative model that, that, that a starting point is finding a way to communicate? Yes. Oh, that was to Chisato, Dalibor, but you can... Yes, yeah. sorry. It's okay. Sorry. I was thinking aloud. That's really fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I mean, I know we talk about this word access a lot for deaf and disabled artists, but actually access itself can definitely become art. And um, our artistic access is 
I believe, a, a really great way to um, bring, bring a space alive in such a way that something can grow and come out of that space that really becomes a, a form of art. And it's a strong way of working, I think. I, I agree it's a strong way of working. I have a question, Chisato, for you that may, I may have to think about. But actually, if I am proposing that our practice is leadership itself, I wonder if we can say the same thing about access, that access, rather than being a vehicle to leadership or a vehicle to our practice, that actually there's something interesting in how we think about access for ourselves and each other that is, is deeply autonomous and actually deeply leaderful. Do you, does that make sense for you or anybody in fact? Yeah, I mean, access is not one fixed thing, is it? No. Because, you know, um, traditional access, let's say, obviously it can be a positive thing and you can develop growth from that. But, I mean, you know, we don't know what, what else is to come. We can still explore that, I think. Yeah. I, I definitely feel that. Yeah. This is my experience. I was just picking up on what you were saying, I think. I think it's inherent, and you know, for me anyway, that leadership in regards to my access needs does become a part of my job of what I do because you've got to advocate for your own access needs or accessibility. But it would be great that actually that, that is taken care of, so then you can focus on your job or your role, whether it's performing or, or being a leader or running a project. Um, so then the focus and energy goes on on the art rather than how you have to get there every day to, to be there. Um, but I also wanted to pick up also a bit that we're talking about around leadership and maybe there are these different models that we'll obviously talk about a little bit more, but, but also about leadership style. Yes. You know, one of those is about collaborative leadership. And for me, I feel that's what I try to, uh, try to obtain and create in the space that I work. But there are obviously some leaders who, who want to take the, the road of, I'm leading this project, this project is my ideas. And, and I, I think, you know, I don't know whether there's one that's better than the other, but there are different styles of leadership that I think we're sort of picking up on. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think there's a for me there's a bit of a discrepancy between how we experience leadership in the arts in general and how we understand leadership in society or the world. That actually, I don't know if anyone's encountered it, but there's some, I'm sure you have. There's some fairly terrible writing around leadership theory that what a leader should look like the body language of leadership which actually if you want a site for thinking about um, deaf and disabled artists it's a really great way in because none of us fit into that archetypal this is what a leader is you know they're upright they're whole they're hearing they're seeing all, all these things that you know they're loud undefinable <laughs> is it is it impossible to say this is what I would this is you know I, I you know I could say that for me ideal leadership is a space that allows for um, access in its broadest sense where we can make space for multiple voices where we can pass decision making but I, it would be very difficult for me to bullet point what it is exactly mm -hmm. I don't know does it does anybody have what, what would ideal perfect leadership look and feel like if there's such a thing this is Mark speaking. Um, straight away, I just feel like it would, it would be hard to pinpoint what the ideal is, in, especially for, for my circumstances. It also dep you know, depends on the project, the work, the people. I mean, there are times when I'm creating a work or working with a group of people that that, that, that space that I create may shift and change because of the needs of the group. Often I'll say, like, I'm, I feel like I'm more of a facilitator, creating that space. And, and yes, I set the times and work with people with when the decisions need to be made. But, but it does also, for me, I've learned through my leadership roles where some projects haven't worked so well or I haven't done so well or I've, I've failed and that's okay. But I've also learned from that as well that not every situation is going to call for the exact same way of leading or, the, or facilitating a project so for me it's also needing to be a bit more organic as well and 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 listening to what the space and what the group needs and the best way it can be supported perfect leadership 
I don't think it exists. <laughs> I think we all just try to do our best in leadership situations. For example, you know, if you have a group of people and everyone's getting on great, but the art you create is you know not that can that can happen you know sometimes if someone can create a situation where everyone's working together fantastically and you feel like what a brilliant situation but actually the work you've created didn't say anything to anyone and sometimes it can be really difficult when you're working with other people but actually the work that comes out of it can can be stronger and go further and digital technology i think is a, is a massive help with everything at the moment and i think it will help that's a great point. I mean, I love that. And just to tie your comment in with Mark's, that it, of, of course, if any of us were going into choreograph or direct a week, uh, a piece, and we had two weeks, on the first Monday, we might be so collaborative, it's beyond belief and lovely and listening to everybody, including everyone. By the Thursday of the second week, we might be quite grumpy leaders who are really feeling the pressure of a deadline. And that, that so that kind of, organic environment and I think Chisato you're absolutely spot on that of course you can have the most amazing process and um, less exciting um, product for want of a better word I think that's really um, a really great point yeah Dalibo I'd like to ask you just because um, I know we all work in different but as you're currently in a show and working with the company how, when does it when you're being led or when you're leading, can you kind of speak about where it feels good when it works? Is that a possible question? Do you want me to rephrase? It is possible to answer this question, but uh, it, is, it is hard, uh, hard uh, to, to decide in, in, in some way, because uh, for example, uh, I, I like when someone uh, when someone someone lead me, because uh, because uh, then I don't have to make uh, too, too too much too much decisions, uh, be uh, be too too much re responsible, uh, uh, think uh, think uh, think and uh, and and work much also, and I also like to be leader. Be, because because then uh, then I feel uh, feel kind kind of kind of kind of that, that that I'm in charge, I'm I'm in power. May, maybe maybe for me that uh, that sounds that sounds a bit uh, a bit too 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 how you say in English uh, too too self uh, self self forward forward be, 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 because because uh, I'm, I'm I'm tall I think of myself I'm, I, I look good so 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 I need to to kind of kind of lo look out when when I'm when I'm le leading something or is, or if it's something about leadership leadership for me that 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 that, that I don't look like like I'm full of myself or something mm. I mean I think I have to be clear that I'm speaking from personal experience. I think just to, to relate what you're saying to Maria's earlier comment that actually I'm aware that that I've, I have fallen into leadership almost by just by sheer being here, that there's nothing conscious that I did, but I am aware that I've come into it from a kind of lifelong background of pretty low expectation of what I'm of of leading. So I often have that inner, exactly as you're describing, that kind of, oh, don't don't think of yourself too highly, or don't that there's a there's often an inner voice that um, is with me lots of the time. But I, I actually think when I'm in leadership positions, that voice often makes me a better leader. It makes me a bit more um, understanding of of the people I'm with. I'd I'd like if I can, just to bring us almost full circle. And whilst I absolutely am not proposing that um, we as deaf and disabled artists can um, solve the problem of a lack of um, disabled leadership in the arts, I do, I'm aware that, that just to capitalise on the knowledge and experience in this group of people, I wonder if um, 
we can just take a few moments to think about what, because actually for, in the UK, certainly the reality is the directors, um, programmers of theatres, directors of festivals, artistic directors overall, these are generally held by non -disabled, our non-disabled peers. And I wonder if there's any, anything from our experience that we would, we would put in place. Or we th and I think actually, Maria, your point is maybe one of those things is allowing uh, um, experimentation, allow thinking about ego, being transparent about, about what it is to kind of um, be in those roles. I, d I mean, I don't know, I think I, if I kick us off, I, I, I mean, I've definitely changed. I, maybe 10 years ago, I would be like, it's not hard, just do it. Just, just make those spaces and it will be all right. And I still have a bit of that in me, but I think now with, with kind of more experience, I, I'm, I would be inclined to say to any theatre or, or organisation, you know, educate yourself on crip time. Really understand, embed crip time into your organisation overall. Understand that we operate at a different pace and time. That, I mean, that if I was just going to do like one tip. So I don't know if anybody, if, if you, I'm not asking you to come up with an answer, but what do you think would make it better if there are people who are, who, if we agree that having disabled leaders, more disabled, deaf and disabled leaders in these positions in the arts would help, how can we, how could that be made possible? That's a big old question. I think that's a really interesting thing about crypt time because this keeps coming up and I'm, I'm re it really resonates with, with me uh, at, at the moment because I'm feeling a bit burnt out anyway. And I'm like thinking when you see, like it's in, I've been in the arts quite a while now and um, it, there have been moves, you know, um, by funders, for instance, to include access provision in their application processes and things like that, which is great. If my understanding was that that access included, or maybe that's, maybe that's, because I think that some of those funders have taken on things because, um, you know, the disabled movement has made, made it clear that that's something that they need to do. Maybe if there was an understanding that that access meant more time as well, you know, our real time, to be able to generate and recover, I would, um, that would, that would be very, very good. Yeah. Agreed. Anyone else on what, what could make those spaces more accessible? Mark? Um, <laughs> I think drawing on my most recent experience of being artistic director at Access Dance Company in America for the last five years, I, I got really burnt out as being, you know, artistic director and, and sort of leading the company. Not because I didn't have the passion or the drive, I definitely did, I still do. But I think what would have helped me is to have in place um, some of the needs I needed in regards to my accessibility for me as a disabled person were in place. So I didn't have to worry about all of that. Um, then I would have had more time to focus on my energy on leading the company, on working with the dancers, on commissioning new artists. But so my energy gets wasted with, you know, getting to and from, pushing my chair, or, you know, we're trying to work that those long days. So if we can look at, okay, so what are the, your needs and how can we support you to be a leader um, in the arts? I would say for me, it would be about, I, I need a support worker to, to assist me. You know, I need to make sure that the spaces I go into are obviously accessible. I need to know that I can have regular breaks or a limited time on computer or, or only two meetings a day, um, or that we don't work from 10 to six. Maybe there are bigger, longer breaks throughout the day. So I think sort of looking at how we pull apart what a sort of model of leadership is or an organizational structure of leadership is, and, and how we can bring in some of our lived experiences and what our access needs are to support what that could be to help other disabled leaders fulfill their role. <laughs> well done, team. <laughs> well done, Kate, for guiding yeah. us through. Yeah, that was really thank, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. On and on and on. <laughs>